Murder at the Vanities celebrated the era with a musical number about the comforts of a drug that would be outlawed three years later. It was a big number with a wonderful girl, and the whole stage was filled with these great big leaves. It was all green, and, um, and that was what got the movie banned. Sweet marijuana, marijuana. But when we made it, it was perfectly legal. Not everyone was aware of exactly what Gertrude Michael was singing about. including the star of the show. Well, I didn't know what it meant. I thought that marijuana was some kind of a Mexican musical instrument. I had a costume that was made of three things, two here and one there, and then some strings. It was called a South Sea Island number. I called my mother and I said, I can't come out of the dressing room because I'm not wearing practically anything. She came over and she took a look and they told her that I would only be dressed like that in the movie. They would never make still pictures. It turns out that I have a picture of this on my wall in my New York apartment. <laughs> This was the era of choreographer Busby Berkeley, whose kaleidoscopic production numbers gave real meaning to the objectification of women. Sometimes he literally dressed them as objects, but few of his dancers seemed to mind. I thought the costumes were wonderful, scanty and beautiful. I thought they were flattering to the figure, and we all had good figures then, too choreographed or directed 15 films during the pre-code era and he was always looking for something new by a waterfall it was it was this pool that Busby had built it was of glass so that you could shoot underneath it and at this one point Buzz said uh, May he says I need a good pair of legs here now do you think you could dive through their legs and come up on the other end smiling? And I said, I think so, Buzz. He says, okay, well, let's shoot it. And uh, we did, and it was one take. Good churchgoers in the audience listened with some alarm as Marlena Dietrich sang about hot voodoo. And then, Tarzan and Jane did something that took our breath away. Wait, Tarzan! Ah! Total nudity had arrived, done with taste and humor, but it still caused an uproar, even though the swimming sequence was shortened in most prints. As critics noted, Tarzan was a film that would be seen by thousands of children. And to add to this, many viewers were confused about the marital status of Tarzan and Jane. Their marriage in the first film was never seen. In any way, this sequel was called Tarzan and His Mate, not Tarzan and His Wife. In 1934, Tarzan and His Mate was condemned by the Detroit Diocese of the Roman Catholic Church for suggestive sex in its storyline. Tarzan. You're a bad boy. Mm. Other condemned films included Queen Christina and Flying Down to Rio. The Legion of Decency chimed in with its own warning when it reviewed MGM's Riptide. We advise strong guard over all pictures which feature Norma Shearer. They are doing more than almost any other type of picture to undermine the moral code. Well, the Catholics were basically responsible for the production code coming in in this stringent form. They were the ones who were shocked by things like DeMille's The Sign of the Cross. Somebody wrote outrage that the Christians were dull and plotting and the pagans had all the fun, you know? <laughs> so it was a big argument for paganism. William Randolph Hearst ran a major newspaper campaign against Hollywood and the immorality. So all the, these forces were converging and they presumably represented some, at least some, of the popular feeling. There is no room on the screen at any time 
for pictures which offend against common decency. Joseph Breen, who had worked for four years in the Hayes office, was supposed to be a hired gun for the studios. But he truly believed that Hollywood was immoral, and he never told his employers about the full extent of his connection to the Catholic Church. Breen is the one indispensable man that brought about the code. When Breen got a job in the Hayes office, what he did was he used that and wrote speeches for Catholic clergy and used his connections with Catholic clergy to help start the Legion of Decency, which was a Catholic group that raided films and told Catholics whether they can go to the movies or not. When Breen got the Catholic Church behind him and they formed the Legion of Decency, he finally had the big stick that he needed. And that's how he brought Hollywood to its knees. The Archbishop in Philadelphia said from the pulpit, you are not to attend any motion picture in this city under pain of mortal sin until you hear differently from me. And they didn't. Having orchestrated the crisis, now Breen conveniently had a plan to save the studios. It required absolute enforcement of the old production code, which had been voluntary, but no more. Now movies could not be shown unless they carried the new production code seal of approval. Without the seal, the fine was $25,000. Not only this, but no film could even enter production unless its script had been read and approved. Breen's control would be complete and without the possibility of appeal. The new plan went into effect July 1934, and for nearly 30 years, the Breen method would control American movies. Keep away from the code me. changed what we saw with its specific directions and prohibitions. Do it again. I like it. Do it again. No picture should lower the standards of those who see it. And you, Mr. Uh -huh. Obscenity should not be suggested by gesture or manner. Well, turn your face to the wall. Scenes oh, of undressing should be avoided. Scenes of passion should not be presented in such a way as to arouse or excite the passions of the ordinary spectator. Nudity is never permitted. You do hello, stranger. Hello there. How are you? Where's your husband? He's gone. Oh. Adultery as a subject should be avoided. The dozens of prohibitions under the code added up to something even more significant. The production code closed off a whole area of women's expression, with, of their sexuality, their sensuality, of their sexual playfulness, uh, double entendres. It was a whole dimension that hadn't ever been given its due to begin with. So it cut it off right at the beginning, right as women were feeling their way into a new kind of relationship with men, a new kind of relationship with their bodies and a uh, kind of unabashed enjoyment of sexuality, suddenly that was gone. That whole area was gone. To me, the worst thing about the production code was that it kept mature thought f from an audience that was ready for it. You would hear, oh, that, that's a wonderful book that had just come out, but it'll never get by the code. Now, for women, it wasn't only the crime that didn't pay. Nothing paid. Having a job didn't pay, cheating on your husband didn't pay, not taking your husband back didn't pay, having a sex life, it all didn't pay. Once the code came in, all the women in Hollywood got their virginity back, and if they lost it again, they were in big trouble. Turn on that lamp. Bring it closer. I just have something to work with. Before the code, Kay Francis starred in the film Mary Stevens, M.D., at the climax of the film, she improvises a way to save a choking baby with a distinctly feminine tool, her own hairpin. I got it. I was just wondering. They say medicine's a man's game. I wonder what a man would have done in a case like this. Contrast that with the flame within, made under the code in 1935. All right, suppose we were married. Suppose we were husband and wife right now. Would you let me sit up half the night as I do most nights on these case histories? I don't think you'd want to, would you, Mary? You mean no work, no work? I think so, no. Anne Harding plays a psychiatrist who gives up her career and Mary, everything she has worked for to marry a man who doesn't approve of a woman working. And the happy ending of the film, the ending that's supposedly happy, is her turning her back on her entire life. When's a happy day? The way Harding plays this scene, despite the fact that the music and everybody else seems to think is a happy ending, she plays it as a moment of abject defeat and soul death. 
I'm not going on with the work. From this minute, I'm not going on with the work. And it's as if she's trying to sneak out a message. And I like to think that that message is for us. What are you going to do? You tell me. To see what this very intelligent, very modern actress was trying to tell us about this ridiculous, demented ending that she was being subjected to. In 1940, when a producer wrote to inquire about remaking Shearer's The Divorcee, Joseph Breen responded, This material is unacceptable under the code as it is now administered. For decades, the pre-code legacy would remain hidden, a buried treasure. The actresses of pre-code present a vital image of the birth of the modern era, and today it's impossible to watch them without admiration. To see them is to marvel at how things are still the same. And it's to do that thing that can't be done, though movies come closest. It's to stop time, to hold a precious moment in your hands. Come on, put them around me.